Welcome to episode 132 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tale of Odysseus and the story of Telemachus and Nestor. Telemachus went down to the shore. He washed his hands in the surf of the sea and called to the god who had come to him in human shape the day before. At his prayer, Pallas Athene approached him in the shape of Mentor, his father's friend, and said, If the spirit of your father, wise Odysseus, has not wholly forsaken you, stir up your soul to action and carry out your decision. I, your father's friend, will see to it that a swift ship is prepared for you, and I will accompany you myself. Telemachus, who thought he had heard the counsel of Mentor, hastened toward the palace, firmly resolved to set out on his journey. On the way, he met Antinos, who caught at his hand laughingly and said, Why so rebellious and gloomy? Come eat and drink with us as you did before. Let the citizens see to your ship and its crew. When everything is ready, sail to Pylos if you like. But Telemachus replied, No, Antinos, I can no longer sit at the same board with you. I am not a boy any more. From now on, whether I go or stay, you shall deal with a full-grown man, but I will go, and nothing shall keep me. And as he spoke, he withdrew his hand and hurried to his father's storerooms, where gold and bronze were kept, where costly tunics filled the chests, and flasks of fragrant oil and big jars of old wine were set up around the walls. All these things were under the care of your Eclea, an old serving woman. When he had entered and closed and bolted the doors behind him, he said to her, Quick, fill twelve two-handled jars with the choicest wine and seal them well. Then pour twenty measures of barley meal into well-sewn skins and put everything together before nightfall. But after my mother has gone to her sleeping chamber, I shall fetch everything. Do not tell her that I have gone to look for my father until twelve days have passed unless she asked for me before that. Your Eclea wept at his going, but promised to do as he had asked. Meantime, Athene had assumed the shape of Telemachus, enlisted men for the journey, and borrowed a ship from Nomon, a wealthy citizen of Ithaca. Then she dazed the minds of the suitors. The cups dropped from their hands, and they fell into a deep sleep. When she had done this, she again appeared as mentor, joined Telemachus and urged him not to put off his departure. Swiftly, they went to the shore where they found the ship and the crew. They had ample provisions stored in the hold and then went aboard. When the waves were already lapping the keel and the wind swelled the sails, they poured a libation to the gods and all night sped over the sea with a favorable breeze. At sunrise, Pylos, Nestor's city, lay before their eyes, the people had come to the shore in nine groups, each of which sacrificed nine black bulls to the god of the sea. They burnt the offering of, to Poseidon to prepare the feast on the meat. When the men from Ithaca landed, Athene in the guise of Mentor led Telemachus to the center of the ring where Nestor sat with his sons. Servants went back and forth preparing the board while others turned the meat on the roasting spits. As soon as the Pyleans saw strangers come ashore, they thronged to meet them, clasped their hands in greetings, and pressed Telemachus to sit beside their king, Pisistras. Nestor's son, who was as young as Telemachus, greeted him and mentor with the warmest hospitality, and bade them take a seat of honor on the thick, soft fleeces between Nestor and his son, Thrasymedes. Then he set before them the choicest pieces of meat filled two golden cups with wine, drank to them, and said to the old man who was with Athene, Pour libation to Poseidon, O stranger, and tell your younger friend to do likewise, for mortals are in need of the favor of the gods. Athene took the cup, begged Poseidon to bless Nestor, his sons, and his people, and prayed that he might help Telemachus accomplish what he had set out to do. Then she poured the wine out on the sand and told the son of Odysseus to do the same. When they had eaten and drunk, old Nestor graciously asked the strangers where they had come from and what was the object of their journey. Telemachus replied to both questions, and when he began to speak of his father, 
He sighed and said, Up to now our attempts to find out what has happened to him have been in vain. We do not know whether he died on the mainland, at the hands of foes, or drowned in an angry sea. And so I beg you, tell me what you know. Perhaps you yourself witnessed his death, or heard of it from travelers. Do not spare us from a sense of pity, but tell us the truth. Now that you speak of those mournful years, I shall tell you the whole tale, answered Nestor. And after the fashion of old men, he began very far back. First, he named the heroes who had died near the walls of Troy. He told of the quarrel between the two sons of Atreus, and finally of his own journey home. Of Odysseus, he knew just as little as Telemachus himself. But he related the story of Agamemnon's death in Mycenae and the vengeance of Orestes. In the end, he advised Telemachus to go to Sparta, to King Menelaus, who had only just returned from a distant land on whose coast a storm had wrecked his ship. Since he had been on his homeward journey longer than any other Argive hero, he was the most likely to have heard something somewhere of the fate of Odysseus. Athene approved Nestor's counsel and said, "'While we have been talking with one another, darkness is falling. Permit my young friend to accompany you to your palace and sleep there. I myself will see to the ship and spend the night aboard. In the morning I shall sail to Coconius, where I have a debt to collect.' But I beg you to send my friend Telemachus to Sparta with one of your sons, and to give him your swiftest horses. So saying, Athene suddenly changed into a sea eagle and soared into the sky. All gazed after her in astonishment, and Nestor took Telemachus by the hand and said, You have no cause to be sad, for young as you are, gods protect you and walk at your side. Your companion was Athene, the daughter of Zeus, who also favored your father above all other Achaeans. Then the old man prayed to the goddess, promised to sacrifice a yearling heifer to her, and the next morning his sons, the husbands of his daughters, conducted his guests to the palace of Pylos. Here a last libation was poured, and the cup passed from one to the other. Then they lay down to sleep. For Telemachus a couch had been prepared in the great hall, and next to him lay Pisistrophus, Nestor's brave son. At the first pale light of dawn, Nestor rose, went to the threshold, and seated himself on one of the polished stones, which were placed on either side of the door. His own father, Nelos, had liked to sit there. Presently his six sons joined him, and the last to come, Pisistrus, brought with him the guests from Ithaca, lordly Telemachus, and now the heifer, which Nestor had pledged the goddess, was led to the place. Laerces, the goldsmith, was summoned to gild her horns. Slaves fetched wood and fresh water and prepared the sumptuous board. Up from the shore came the comrades of Telemachus. Two of Nestor's sons held the cow by her gilded horns. Another brought a basin and barley for the offering. A fourth the axe to strike down the victim. A fifth held the bowl to catch its blood. When the animal had been felled with the axe, Pisistros, the sixth son, cut its throat, while Nestor's wife and daughters prayed to the gods. The best pieces were burned as an offering to Athene, and on them dark wine was poured. The rest was put on spits and roasted. Meanwhile, Telemachus refreshed himself in a warm bath, and now appeared clad in a splendid tunic and a costly mantle. While all feasted the best and the fleetest horses were harnessed to take the guests to Sparta. A servant put wine and provisions into the chariot with Telemachus mounted. Up beside him sprang Pisistros, and he took the reins and swung the goad. The horses flew along the road, and soon Pylos was left behind. All day long they drove, and the horses did not tire. When the sun was about to set and all the roads grew dark, they came to the city of Phira, where an Argive hero by the name of Diocles, son of Ortilochus, had his house. He received the two of them with warm hospitality, and they spent the night with him. The following morning they drove on between fields of wheat, and on the next evening came to the great city of Lestamion, or Sparta, flanked on all sides by steep, jagged mountains. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, 
enjoy the journey.